Okay, moving on. So today we're going to wrap up this lecture on GUIs and events. And in the previous day, we covered the basic components, right? We covered JFrame and the various J components that you can add on to your frame, like panels, like labels, menu bars, uh, text fields, text areas. This last one we didn't cover, we ran a little bit out of time, is the J button. Okay, so we like the J button. It creates a small clickable button. So here's our K-frame. On our K-frame, let's add a button down at the bottom. Okay, so we're gonna do this J button JB. All right, so here we're gonna add a button. Add a J button. Now let's make two of them. We're gonna call this JB1 and JB2. Okay, so we're gonna add them to our JP base panel. And the second one. And we're gonna create them as new objects. Okay, so we'll say JB1 equals new J button. And when you call the constructor on a J button, any text you want to include as a label for the button, you can just send that along as an argument going to the constructor. So I'm gonna make two of them. I'm gonna make uh, one called clear and one called, I'm gonna one labeled, I don't know, new line. And do that. So we can do some new stuff here. All right. So let's see what we have. Let's uh, create these new buttons. We'll see them that they are visible down there. All right. So if we expand this out, whoop, we need to make it a little bigger. There we go. There's our two buttons, clear and new line. And at this point, we haven't set the buttons to do anything, but they are buttons. They are there. They are clickable. We can click them. Okay. So all this, these are just a bunch of objects we've added on. Not a whole lot of any real interest is going on. What uh, the real interest is making these GUI components respond to user actions. So let's start in on that. Okay, first thing, uh, colors. Well, colors, that's what we'll do to just give a quick indication of what's going on. Now, the standard way to do colors in Java is with a 24-bit RGB. So basically, you have three numbers. Let's see, R we'll start with red, zero to 255. And then you have green, one byte for green colors. Again, zero to 255. And then one more, Whoa, we got someone. And then one more for blue. And likewise, blue, 0 to 255. Okay, so these are our, our sets. And when we blend them all together, I know you guys learned in primary school with paints that if you mix red and yellow and blue together, those are your primary colors and you get other ones. But weirdly for video screens, it actually works as red and green and blue. And you mix them together to get different colors. Anyway, any of these colors we can create as new backgrounds. So for example, what do I have here on my J panel? In my JP base, did I set a background? I set red, okay? But what I could do instead of that, I could set any color you like. So I could do uh, J, I could do color C equals new color, okay? And I could set that with three, create new color with, uh, RGB codes. Okay, so the three ones I could send along. Uh, what's a color you want? What do you want to see? Give me a color that's not red or green or blue. Oh, here we go. The fish has bit. Okay, what do we got? Pink and orange. Okay, we'll do one of each of those. Okay, so pink. Pink will just be red, but light mixed with the others. Okay, so it'll be red, but closer to white. So in order to do that, right, all three colors together, if they're maxed out at 255, that will be white. Okay, so if we're mixing red and white, it's a little bit of a blend of those. So we have a lot of red and then some of the other two. So let's see what we can do here with that. Let's try to make 255 to max out the red. And then for the other two, let's do something like, I don't know, 
200 and 200. We'll see how that goes. So we're gonna set that as the background color. Instead of color.red, we're just gonna do our new color C. We'll see how that goes. Let me guess at this. Hey, that's a pretty good pink. How about that? Okay, likewise, if I wanna do orange, well, red and yellow, right? Well, yellow is again, a weird combination kind of of, of all three colors. It's a, it's a little strange to get. So orange, let's try to mix that up. We'll leave it with plenty of red and we're gonna have quite a bit of green. But let's see if we add it, make it bluer, if we make pink bluer, that should lean it, I'm thinking, in a little bit less orangey, more orangey. Let's see if we dial it down to 100, if that looks more orange. Orange is a tricky one. There we go. See, we got some orange there. Anyway, you can play around with these. If you wanna make it closer to orange, we could probably dial that up a little bit to 224 perhaps, and dial, whoop, not 200, 2240, and dial this down a little bit to say 64. That might make it orangier. Let's save it. Yeah, a little bit closer to yellow. Anyway, orange and yellow are a little bit tricky to get, but with a little bit of playing around, you can get them. Okay, or you could use one of your various online color palettes, right? So you could look up uh, things like this online. You look RGB code for orange, right? Just look it up because, so here we go. Just orange, orange, FF A500. Okay, so nothing on the blue and then a fairly high uh, green, so that's be 165 there, and then max out the red. So let's see how that looks. I was going the right way, I just didn't go far enough. Let's do no blue, because there's no blue in orange. Yeah, it's pretty orange. All right. So anyway, there's, you know, you can make all kinds of different colors with this stuff. Neat. Uh, key ones that you ought to know, you know, obviously, if they're all 255, that you know adds all the colors together, just as we know from like fifth grade science, if you blend all the colors of the rainbow together, you get white light. So if you maximize the luminance on all these, that's what these numbers are, you mix them together, you get white light. Uh, if they're all zero, then you know just like a, uh, a black hole, there's no light escaping from it, and you know it appears black to us. So if these are all zeros, it's black. And anything in the middle, like 128, 128, 128, that'll be like a medium gray. Other colors you can kind of play around with, but for example, if you just want to make pure red, that'd be 255 comma zero comma zero. If you want to make purple, that's going to be a blue blend of red and blue. So 255, zero, 255, for example. Okay, anyway, that's colors, that's a quick thing. And there's also a bunch of static constants like we used before, color.red. All right, so. We talked about stacking components. We've done that. I'm not too worried about that. Oh, uh, well, we got to do layout managers. Fine. So if you just stack components onto a GUI panel, it's going to be a little bit chaotic, right? It's going to be like this stuff we have here that doesn't look that great. So if you want to order things up a little bit, the best way to do it is set up some kind of layout manager, right? A layout manager that's going to say, these things go here. Uh, the easy one we can do this with. So they all have their quirks, but there's, there's basically three uh, main ones. There's quite a few others, there's, you know, a dozen or so in the standard Java library and many others that custom people have made custom. But uh, first one, the flow layout, this is basically like MS Word uh, components are added left to right as space permits and additional components appear on new lines, okay? Are added left to right and centered, I should add. So if you do a flow layout, it's gonna basically be like text in Microsoft Word. It'll be centered in the middle of the window. And as you add more components and it spreads out wider, then eventually some of those components are gonna be pushed onto new lines. Or same thing if you shrink the window smaller, it's the same thing's gonna happen. Okay, another one is the grid layout, okay? Grid layout divides the space into equal sized rectangles, okay? And the grid layout has some quirks. Uh, quirk is that many objects will expand to fill 
an entire square, an entire rectangle, J buttons especially. J buttons and text fields, text boxes will also do that. And that can look really weird, so you usually don't want to do that. Uh, last one is the box layout. Box layout basically allows arranging components in a line either horizontally or vertically. Okay, so you can add them again in your window doing that. And of course, you can mix and match any of these within a window. Okay, so for example, you could have like on my Connect 4 game, uh, for those of you who paid attention, I had one window, right, the main window like this was set as a box layout. And in that box layout, I had uh, three panels that roughly divided up the space like this. And then within the middle panel, I had another uh, grid layout for all my uh, Connect 4 game squares. So if you go back and look at the code, you can see what I did there. I don't need that. But let's implement uh, a box layout for this one because that'll look a little better. So we're going to do this. So for JP base, implement, or we'll say uh, apply a box layout to JP base. Okay, so JP base, we call it set layout manager. Okay, set layout new box layout. The constructor for box layout is a little bit weird. So you send along two arguments. Okay, box layout constructor requires the object itself, right? Whatever object you're gonna apply that box layout to and the orientation. So vertical or horizontal. So our new box layout will just be JP base and then one of the uh, constants box layout, and uh, we'll do that y-axis. We'll again set these vertically, okay? So if I do this, then everything's gonna be arranged vertically in a line. And this is somewhat better, right? I can do better things with that. But notice these text boxes, they expand crazy big, right? And that looks kind of awful. We don't really want that. Uh, and it's also all uh, left uh, left arranged in the margin. If I wanted to do it uh, oriented in the y, the x axis, for example, could do that. Boom, then it stretches out that way. And again, looks a little weird, right? So I have this text box, it's going to be ridiculously large. So what we often want to do is divide our surface into panels. So for this, what I might do is have one panel that covers this uh, box here, another panel that contains these two text boxes, and another panel that contains these, these two buttons, right? I might do something like that. So let's do, well, we could do one for both of them. So let's, uh, let's re-add how this panel goes. So I have a new J panel. I'm gonna add a new J panel, uh, JP1, JP2, JP3. Okay, and those are gonna be, those are gonna contain different things. So let's see. Uh, create panels to add components, All right? So I'll do JP1 is a new J panel. We're gonna do JP base dot add JP1, okay? And then instead of adding these uh, components to JP base, I'm gonna add them to JP1 instead. So this image icon, I'm gonna add to JP1. This text label, all right? So I'm gonna say new panel, right? I'm gonna do two more here. JP2, JP3, JP2, and JP3. Okay, so the text label, I'm also going to add to JP1. That's fine. Okay. These guys, the J menu, that's going to be unrelated. Text field and text area, I'm going to add these to JP2. All right, maybe I'll add the text area and the text buttons to JP3. 
And now I can see how this looks. All right, so I've divided the uh, area a little better. And it's definitely, oops, something didn't line up there. What, oh, did I not do the background? Background's a little weird. All right, first I want a Y axis. Okay, and I'm gonna do JP1. I'll set its background. I'm gonna fix that. Okay, so. Okay, JP2, I'll do a different color. I'll say C equals new color. I could just set it, right? I could just do it like this, JP2 dot set background, new color. I don't know, I'll make this one purple. So 255.0255. And then this one, I'll do a different way. I'll do uh, JP3 set we we'll use one of the constants, like so light blue, I guess. Well, that's light gray, cyan, yeah. Okay. So here we have a uh, set background. Okay, so all of these different panels are gonna have different background colors now. It'll look a little better. So here we go. So it's blended up, it's a little better. And you'll see that even when you resize it, right, there's some lag there, does some weird screwy stuff. But one of the things that's overriding, this image tries to be as big as it can. So you'll, you'll see that there are some different priorities in how it wants to display things, right? So for example, this label, title sunny day below the image, as long as there's space for it, it'll try to show that uh, onto the side, right? But once it isn't, right, it'll try to show it over here if there's a large window. But once that gets a little bit cramped, it's gonna show it down below. Likewise, these lower panels start getting scrunched, right? And they sort of go away before this image goes away. So as last resort, uh, Java says, well, our top priority is to display this entire image. As long as we can have enough room to display the image, that's what we're gonna show. So again, there's a lot of weird prioritizations built into how the GUIs are displayed. It takes a lot of trial and error and playing around before you get familiar with, you know, how it's all gonna work. But at any rate, if our window is big enough, we can divide it into areas like this and everything is good. Okay, so we have that. Uh, now, on any of those, we could set a grid layout or a uh, flow layout, some other kind of layout. So for example, if I wanted to do a, uh, I could do another box layout on uh, J, JP1, right? I could apply what that one there and say, force that label to always appear below it. So I could do same thing here. Apply a box layout and do it on JP1. And then those two components, the image and the label beneath them will appear in a vertical alignment. See, so there we have it. But now I'm only seeing as the background that, so that's a little strange. Very strange there. All right, so there's sometimes these uh, unplanned interactions. So I see it, but I kind of don't see it, right? It just shows the image and the rest of this, it's almost like that panel isn't there. If I do, I'm seeing some of uh, the other panel beneath it. This is uh, actually quite strange. I have not done this before. It has not applied before. So I'm gonna see if I'm seeing JP base. I'm gonna make the color JP base, uh, set background, new color, Zero two fifty five zero. I'm just going to make it bright green. I should see that instead of that gray. Yeah, so that's really strange. I had not uh, noticed that before. There are all all kinds of quirks in this stuff. So when I applied the box layout there, this panel doesn't actually fill up, or this image and this uh, label don't actually fill up the whole space of the panel. The panel is just that part of it. A little strange. Anyway, my point is you got to play around with these windows for a while to get them to do exactly what you want. It's a little tricky that way. Okay, so those are our three layout managers. Uh, again, flow layout is pretty straightforward. Grid layout, if I wanted to, I could apply a grid layout to uh, the text field, but it's gonna look terrible. So if I do this, if I do jp2.setLayout new grid layout, 
one comma one, right? One column, one row. Watch what it does with that text box. It's gonna blow it up so it fills up the whole thing. And it just looks kind of ridiculous when I just have one line of text here. So you gotta be careful with that. All right, we don't wanna do that. If I do the same thing with the buttons, right? Each of these features is gonna be another thing here. So if I do JP3, whoop, sorry, this should go up here. If I do this, JP3 set grid layout, and I do say three column, three rows, that's gonna be, it's not gonna look good either, right? Because again, down here, here's the text area, here's the buttons, the buttons are ridiculously large. So grid layout and buttons and some other components don't always go together so well. All right, we'll just leave that as a flow layout and we'll call it a day. All right, and flow layout pretty much is the default anyway. Okay, so it doesn't really look any different. Now they're down below. Okay. Right, so those are our layout managers. Uh, if you're interested, sure, there's more information available, but we cover these three. Here's box layout, uh, flow layout, grid layout. Yeah, but I wanna get ahead to the interfacing. That's what we really wanted to cover up at the end today. So listener interface, the main point of GUIs is that they respond to user actions like clicking buttons, right? So for this, Java uses what are called listener interfaces. And there are three things you got to do to include a listener interface with your class. First, in the class header, you mention that you're including the interface. Second, any methods that the interface uses, you include those in your class definition. And then last, any object that's supposed to react, you have to specify what other object actually has the code that will interact, that will run when that action happens. So these key things, right? Number one, so if I have class X and class X, I want to implement say action listener, which is the one that does things when buttons happen. Okay, that's the first thing I gotta do. In these, uh, whoop, I gotta implement, include the magic words, implements action listener. Second, somewhere down here, I include the method void action performed. And this one automatically gets what's called an action event. I'll call it AE for action event, okay? This is the method. This method gets called when the event happens, right? When, for example, the button gets clicked. And then somewhere up here where I have a button, so J button JB, I'll have to include a line something like JB dot add action listener this okay so the three things here number one implement the interface that means there's going to be another class an interface class that you can use its methods even though you're not in an inheritance hierarchy with it basically you're going to say these methods exist we're going to borrow them from another class second Right, we'll make that third. Third, specify the object that will run the code when the event happens. Okay, so when I do this, right, put this right here, that means that this X object, whatever X object the button happens to be related to, when the button gets clicked, this is the X object that's going to respond. Okay, and then Second thing is I did it in order, have the method ready, right? Because since I've implemented the interface, that means if somebody clicks on a button, it's supposed to call an action performed method. Well, if this class, right, doesn't have an action performed method, then this object of that class can't respond by calling that method when the action happens. Okay, so these are the three things we gotta do. I can do them now in my code. So let's say, for example, when somebody clicks on the, uh, I'll do random, random background. Let's make that, that would be a little more fun. When somebody clicks on the clear button, that's gonna click on the clear all the text box. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna implement that one first. So extends JFrame and then implements action listener. Okay, and all of these uh, listener classes, they're in the 
java.awt.event package. So here it'll show I have an error. When I hover over the error button, it'll say, oh, you need to add the unimplemented methods. Fine, so I double click that. For action listener, there's only one. So if I scroll all the way down to the bottom here, that's where it gets tacked on, right? So here's my uh, button. This method will automatically ca be called. This method automatically called when a button is clicked, okay? I say when a J button is clicked. All right, I'll call it AE for action event. So last thing I need to do for each of these buttons, I need to specify their action listener. So I'm gonna do that JB1.add action listener this. That means that the K-frame object itself is gonna have the code that runs when somebody clicks on the J button. Likewise, JB2 add action listener, and again, this, so same thing. Okay, so I can do this if the, the action event has a property called get source. So if I say ae.getSource, the object that was clicked to generate the event itself, if I say if ae.getSource equals JB1, okay, then I could do something like, what is it clear? Then I could say JTA set text, nothing, right? I'm going to fill it up with an empty string. So that'll clear the text. Else, if source equals jb2, right, which is my random thing, I can do this. I can say int red equal, well, I got to include a uh, random class now. So import java.util.random. Okay. This is a class that provides random numbers. Okay. Random class for RNG, random number generation. Okay, so int red equals new random dot next int 256. Okay, gets random int from 0 to 255. And I'll do the same thing for uh, blue and green, or green and blue. Okay, so in green, it's going to equal a new value. Blue equals a new value. Uh, okay, and then I'm going to say this, uh, not this, I'm going to say JP3 set background new color, red, green, and blue. Okay, so when I run this, this is what's gonna happen. Okay, so let's blow this thing up all the way. Here's my stuff. So if I do clear, oh no, all the text went away, right? If I do random background, I can just spend all day clicking there, pulling up random numbers. All right, but I don't wanna do that anymore. Okay, but I could, and keep on doing that. Okay, so basically, things are happening when I'm doing actions on the window. Okay. I do a couple more slides. We'll wrap this up quickly because the rest of this we've mostly seen. Uh, so these user interfaces, right, Java is going to handle all the necessary execution flow jumps. It's kind of going on in a separate thread behind the scenes. When somebody clicks on a button, we don't have to build anything additional, right? We just say this button is linked with this object. When somebody clicks on it, it, the code automatically goes to that action performed method. We don't have to do all the behind the scenes linkages. So there's kind of this black box that something goes through in the middle. Anyway, uh, how it works. So basically, uh, the GUI continuously listens for user action. So many, many times a second, the operate at the level of the operating system is saying, did somebody click on something? Is that mouse uh, cursor moving around? Did somebody press a key, right? All of these are being checked at very, very short intervals. And if you take my IDS 3.13 class, we'll do some stuff with JavaScript that's a little bit more interactive and we'll see you know, how some of this stuff plays out in web applications. Anyway, so the GUI continuously listens for user actions like entering text, clicking buttons, whatever. When one of those events happens, the execution flow jumps to whatever method you've specified. Okay, now there's some weird stuff goes on. If you have too many events going on at the same time, uh, sometimes you can have 
multiple things going on that conflict with each other a little bit. Uh, you can have some event methods can block others or not happen in exactly the right sequence you might think they would. Uh, so that, that can cause some weirdness. And basically, reason why that happens is Java tends to run on a single core of your machine. It doesn't generally do true parallelism unless you go through a lot of contortions to make that happen. Uh, for example, like setting up separate Java virtual machines to run on separate cores. So what happens is the different execution threads of your program, they get chopped up and each one gets allotted a slice of time to run sequentially. And sometimes one of these slices needs a little bit more time and can block the other ones. So if there's too much stuff going on in your GUI, that can be a problem. That can kind of overload the system and make things happen in not quite the right order. Okay. So you got to be careful with that. Uh, there are several other basic interfaces. Again, there's like a dozen or so standard ones, things like window listener that listens for window actions like resizing or opening or closing. Uh, there's mouse listener and mouse motion listener that uh, we check for where they are within an object. I believe we did mouse listener with our connect Four application. And of course, action listener. Uh, the big ones that we see use action listener are text boxes and buttons that they essentially have only one kind of action associated with them. Either you click on them or you don't. Okay. So the interfaces, the, uh, the elements of that process, we include implements in the class header line. For example, class K frame implements action listener, add the object itself as a listener for a particular component. For example, for a J button JB, we call action listener and send along this as the argument. So that means that the K-frame object that the J button is on would be the one that responds to the events. And then add the interface methods to the listening class so the execution flow has a place to go when somebody actually clicks the button. Okay. Now, often a GUI will include multiple elements of the same type so they can generate the same kind of event. For example, if you have a set of J buttons, they can all generate action events. Well, you distinguish between them by using the event objects get source method like I did. So anytime a click happens, they're all gonna to go to that same action performed method, but if we, we can distinguish between them with that uh, get source uh, method call, and that'll tell us which object was actually clicked on. Okay, so simple example for a button click, K-Frame implements action listener, we add the button and we add the action listener, uh, we register the listener for it, and then we include the action perform lesson. In this case, it says thanks. Okay. This one, if we read from a J text field, for example, again, our class will implement the action listener interface. We'll associate the action list, we'll associate the K frame object as the listener for the text field JTF. And then again, since text fields use action performed, we'll have here, you know, if somebody presses enter, it'll say, you press whatever, it'll read the text contained in the JTF object, e.getSource, that'll be JTF, and then the getText method will return a string that, contain, that shows whatever was contained in that text field. And last, multiple event sources. So if we have JB1 and JB2 that respectively say, press me and don't press me, okay? Down here within the getSource, right, using the getSource me get method calls, if e.getSource equals JB1, we can print out thanks, because it said press me. Otherwise, if somebody pressed JB2, it'll say, stop that, because JB2 says, don't press me. Okay. That's it. That's the simple stuff for all this. I knew those last few slides go pretty quickly because we've covered this a few times now. So, questions on any of this stuff? What are the big takeaways? The big takeaways are, number one, right, what did we, what did we do? So we talked a little bit about layout managers a little bit about layout managers and their quirks. Okay, so especially a uh, grid layout is a little quirky. Number two, whoop, a little bit about listener interfaces and then how to implement listener interfaces in your GUI windows. Okay, that's what we covered today. So hopefully you have sort of a good handle on this. Uh, this uh, code that I've done, I'll post this up today. And there's the Connect4 application if you wanna check that out. Uh, feel free to play around with different things with this. You know, you're not gonna destroy anything on your machine. 
And if you wreck the code irretrievably, you can always retrieve a clean copy from Blackboard. So before we go, questions on any of this stuff? Is there anything that does not make sense? I'm happy to answer questions. How y'all doing? Doing good? Okay. Anybody? Any troubles? Everything makes a lot of sense. You guys all figure you can do this stuff on your own? Yep. All right. That's all I got for you then. Have a good weekend. Um, if there's an assignment that needs to get posted this week, I might as well check that before I, but I don't think there is. I'm going to check though. Let's open up this syllabus and see. Nope. The next assignment is going to be new next Friday. That's what I thought. So, okay. So have a good weekend, everybody. It's been a hoot. Yep. Professor, is the uh, assignment due Wednesday or Friday? Uh, what the syllabus says, I just had it up a second ago. We can check. Or whatever the assignment says, I guess that would override. Let's see. Let's see what the assignment says. It'd be cool if it's due on Friday. <laughs> well, you can always ask for an extension if you need one. <clears throat> yeah? Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, if you get it done by Wednesday, that's great. And if you don't, you know, or if you just, just want to be cautious right now, send the TA an email and say, hey, just in case, I'll take that extension. Cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, it has to be at least two days before. That's right. So as long as you ask by Monday, it's okay. So if you ask today, that's fine. Yep. All righty. Well, good luck, everybody. Have a good weekend. Stay out of the rain.